Mesdames, Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, Kyrie Kikiri, uh, I can't think of any more languages to go in. My name is John Andrews, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. And um, it's quite a long way, I suppose, from the uh, current obsessions of, uh, of the news headlines, uh, because this is the Indo-Pacific region. We are going to pivot to the Indo-Pacific region, not quite in the way that uh, Barack Obama may have imagined, but anyway, I think it, clearly whatever the current crises are, the medium and long-term questions geopolitically and economically will be in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Now, I have a wonderful panel here, which I'll introduce in just a second, but let me just say a couple of words about this Indo-Pacific region and about the title of this um, this session. This session is about security concerns and economic opportunities. And there's a lot to be said about both. I mean, if you take the region, it has, I could argue, far too many nuclear powers. You've got the US, you've got Russia, you've got China, you've got North Korea, you have some real flashpoints. You've got Taiwan, obviously. India, China, they may be members of the BRICS but actually they're often not quite at daggers drawn, but pretty hostile relationship. You've got plenty of maritime and territorial disputes, which I think include almost everybody, actually, every country in the Indo-Pacific region. Let's just take security first of all. There are so many acronyms and initials that we can um, festoon over this subject. You've got AUKUS, Australia, UK, US, Sorry for France there, but France wanted to sell its submarines to Australia, and Australia said no, and it came to the Brits and the Americans. So there we are, but we'll put that behind us. So there's AUKUS. You have US security treaties, actually with Australia, with New Zealand, with Japan, the Philippines, Thailand, South Korea, and you've got non-treaty partnerships with the US, uh, with India, with Indonesia, with Vietnam. So what, if you think of that as one particular block, what is the, let's say, anti-Western? I have exactly lady may not like this sort of anti-Western idea, but you've got China and North Korea. I suppose that's the only um, mutual aid and cooperation friendship treaty that China has, apart now from its no limits strategic partnership. I'm putting no limits in inverted commas um, with Russia, with, the Russia, with Putin of Russia. A lot of uh, acronyms and um, initials for the economy. We've got the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, which I think uh, actually became really from Central Asia rather than the Indo-Pacific region itself, but does now include lots of players from Indo-Pacific, including India. You've got ASEAN, and ASEAN expands. You've got ASEAN plus three. Uh, you've got RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is ASEAN plus China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. They can all see the economic potential of this region and therefore they see the virtue in collaborating and cooperating. And of course you have the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. 11 members so far, not yet China. And um, rather unfortunately, in my opinion, um, America decided not to go for the TPP way back in the, the day, well, days when uh, Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump. And finally, you've got IPEF, the India Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. I know nothing about this, but so perhaps someone else here does. And that, I think, was launched by Joe Biden in Tokyo uh, last year. Um, will it amount to anything? I don't know. But clearly, we have lots of security concerns, and we have lots of economic opportunities. So really, I'm going to ask the panel to talk about them in that you know, almost binary fashion. Now, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, to my left, Jean-Pierre Cabestin, um, who speaks much better English than most English people, uh, despite being a proud Frenchman. And as he revealed yesterday in a question to uh, the uh, former chief executive of Hong Kong, is now a permanent resident in Hong Kong. 
I hope that this panel will not get you chucked out, but you never know. Uh, Jean-Pierre Cabestin is a professor emeritus at the Hong Kong Baptist University and uh, was uh, a senior researcher with uh, CNRS in France. Uh, Yuichi Hosoya is the uh, professor of international uh, politics at Keio University in Tokyo. Um, uh, Kim chang Bon uh, from Korea, uh, South Korea, because I realize it is on North <laughs> Korea as well. Um, has a very distinguished career as a diplomat, not just uh, ambassador to Indonesia, but also to the European Union, and now representing the Korean Federation of Business. Is that I got the right title, I hope? Hervé Mariton, very distinguished career in French politics, and um, I mean, he's also um, a very important man, chairman of the Franco-British Council. And really my plea to you, Hervé, is to try to get back my rights as a European citizen. Why you allowed Brexit to happen, I do not know. But anyway, <laughs> that's my problem. Um, and then uh, M.K. Narayanan, uh, the former senior advisor to Mamhan Singh, uh, who was a very, very successful and influential prime minister of uh, India. Long and distinguished career in Israeli intelligence. Sorry, Israel. Israel. I, that's a slip of a tongue. <laughs> <laughs> forgive I'm, me, forgive no, me. No, Indian no. intelligence. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think perhaps they needed you in Israel. Yeah, because... I, exactly. You, you, you took the words. I said, I, I think I better, I would have done a better job than what they did when Hamas attacked. <laughs> <laughs> and also former governor of West Bengal. And then last but definitely not least on this panel, uh, Doug Powell, Douglas Powell, who has been very influential diplomat, he's been a very influential academic, and a quite a, a rather successful businessman, so, you know, uh, larger than life almost. But, I think from this particular panel, um, one should actually underline that he was once the American head of the American Institute in Taiwan. That means that in the real world, you were the American ambassador to Taiwan. <laughs> So um, I'll introduce you as that. Uh, anyway, that's your platform, your panel. I think they're all tremendous. Jean-Pierre, the floor is yours. Seven minutes. All right. As you look at the and there's a clock here. Well, thanks a lot uh, for this very kind introduction. Thank you to Thierry de Montbrial and Ifri for inviting me again to this uh, August uh, um, conference um, in which I've learned a lot on other topics like AI and semiconductors, which are very... Uh, re very much related to the topic we're going to talk about. We are located actually uh, uh, at the western end of the Indo-Pacific region, a region which is very vast, which uh, includes maybe two-thirds of the world population and, and maybe more than half of the uh, world GDP. So it's a very, very important region of the world. Even in Europe sometimes, of course, we tend to, I wouldn't say neglect in the Pacific, but we are so focused on Europe and Ukraine for good reason, and also uh, on the Middle East for uh, uh, obvious reasons as well, that uh, the Indo-Pacific maybe is not at the top of the, of the, uh, of the agenda of uh, a lot of, uh, of most, most European uh, leaders and governments. Um, however, I think there are a number of things that we'd like to uh, tell you about very briefly to start with. Uh, since I'm based in Hong Kong, which is part of China, as you may have realized, realized um, I, I would like to say a few things about, first of all, the, the new uh, environment in, in, in the Indo-Pacific, and in, partic in particular the economic environment in which uh, the region is, uh, um, is uh, in, uh, um, uh, is developing today. It's a much slower um, ec um, uh, economic uh, environment than before. The economic growth of China has slowed down to 3%. The Chinese economy is facing a number of issues in the housing sector. Um, local government are in, in the red. Um, and the post-COVID uh, recovery has been quite disappointing. It, it worked well in the first uh, term of this year, but then it has slowed down and there are some concerns. There are also some concerns about uh, employment in China. The unemployment rate officially is around 21%, maybe it's much higher among, the, uh, for, among young people, maybe 40%. And there's a sense of malaise. If you have a, haven't read an article by Evan uh, Osnos in the uh, New Yorker, which is a very interesting uh, magazine, 
And the article tells you quite a bit about the mood of, some, of uh, quite a number of Chinese today. And I can see that um, among my many Chinese students in Hong Kong itself. So, um, so that's the first thing I would like to say. The second thing is, of course, geopolitics is having an impact on, on, on the economy of those uh, uh, in, the, in the region, particularly in the Chinese economy. Um, it's not disrupting everything. Uh, I don't think we, we're witnessing a full decoupling of uh, Chinese and the economy from the US economy or Western economies, uh, but it's disrupting. It complicates uh, the uh, trade flows in a number of sectors. Uh, semiconductors has been mentioned, but also China has uh, retaliated against the sanctions imposed by the US and uh, has decided, uh, started to use also some uh, uh, economic and, and, and uh, tools in order to put pressure on the other side, including restricting the export of uh, gallium, germanium, and graphite to, to, to the US and to other countries as well. Now, what is interesting in this new context is that you see both trends uh, taking shape. One is uh, some kind of um, um, uh, reduction of uh, some countries dependent upon China, and one of these examples is South Korea. We may come back to that. And uh, the, on the other side, we see uh, countries like India, despite the tensions you've alluded to on the border, they still do a lot of trade with China. And uh, actually, the trade deficit between India uh, and China is, is huge and, and keeps growing to the point that now India trades more with, with, with China than with, with the US. Um, so we, we, we're not really witnessing any, any decoupling. Uh, if you look at the trade figures between China and the US or the EU and the US, is still very, very strong. <laughs> And then um, the slowdown has had also, in China, has had other consequences. Um, uh, the fact that the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, now has less steam, uh, less, I mean, in its uh, engine, less money uh, has been involved in, uh, invested in the BRI today. I think it gives opportunity to other players to play a bigger role in the Indo-Pacific region and the global south as a whole. I'm alluding here to a number of initiatives taken by the US, like the, the uh, uh, the, the B3W, uh, built by Becker World, uh, or the Global Gateway of the European Union, or the G7 infrastructure project. So, so there are a number of opportunities here, um, which is also uh, uh, shouldn't be neglected. But I think there are security challenges. Uh, and uh, here I will be uh, brief because we can uh, come back to those challenges. It doesn't mean that every country is aligned uh, to, uh, and, and, and to this new bipolarity, we, 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 uh, with this new bipolarity with, uh, which is emerging in the region between the US and China. I think there's still a lot of uh, leeway for a number of countries, and the best example maybe is India, which is at the same time a very active member of the BRICS, why, why, why being much closer to uh, other partners in Asia through uh, the Quad if you've never heard of the Quad, the Quadrilateral uh, um, Security Forum between India, uh, Japan, Australia, and the US. So we see India playing a you know, very um, diverse role in, in the region. Uh, but what um, dominates in the Indo-Pacific uh, region now is it's, uh, it's really a growing bipolarity and growing tension between the US and China. And the question, of course, is for other players, including the European Union, whether they can, uh, you know, how, how can they play a role in that new context. Now, the, the good news, in a sense, that they, uh, is that there, there are tensions, uh, but for the time being, China is... Uh, uh, playing what, in what we call the gray zone within its, the, gray, the limits of the gray zone strategy, which is to put pressure on the other side, on other players, uh, including the South China Sea, uh, and the Taiwan Strait, and the, even in the East China Sea uh, with Japan around the Senkaku Islands, uh, but doesn't go beyond the threshold of war. So the, the gray zone strategy is not without risks. Uh, I think there are growing risks of incidents, uh, of military crises, uh, and the mini crisis, a military crisis needs to be managed. But I think we have precedents. Uh, one of the best known precedents is the EP3 incident in, in 2001 between the, the US and China, which was you know, uh, negotiated and managed and, and negotiated by both sides' uh, foreign ministry. So, so they, even if today one of the issues, and Doug will come back to that, I'm sure, is the lack of military to military 
relations and, and contacts between the US and China. Uh, I think those meal meal relations will be sooner or later resumed. And uh, if there is a need to com communicate because of a crisis, I think uh, they will find a way to communicate. Um, the, so that, that, that's, the, that's the background now. The, of course, if, if quite a number of people have uh, alarmed about the growing tension in the Taiwan Strait. And for good reasons. And uh, now I don't think that the um, TSMC and the, and the, and the you know, semiconductor industry in Taiwan is an is a efficient shield against any attack from China. The so called silicon shield is not something which I would really invest in or believe in. But uh, what I think is that uh, a number of factors have also led China to think twice about. Uh, starting a military venture against Taiwan. The war in Ukraine is playing a role, clearly. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what is very important to bear in mind is the fact that both China and the US are nuclear powers. And uh, it's very likely that in the case of a Taiwan contingency or a crisis in Taiwan Strait, the US will intervene. So it raises the stakes, clearly. Uh, but as for, uh, the fact that we have two nuclear powers and nuclear weapons, in a sense, are factors of peace uh, rather than factors of war, because that will f compel both sides to think twice before starting a war in the Taiwan Strait. So that's what I, I would uh, insist upon here at this stage, and maybe we can come back to those issues. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Um, Yuichi, the floor is yours, and I should, of course, in the, in the acronym, have mentioned the Quad, but fortunately Jean-Pierre mentioned the Quad, <laughs> and the Quad was a Japanese initiative, so the floor now is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for having me in this session. And also, thank you very much for maintaining attention to the Indo-Pacific region, the most dynamic region, as well as the largest region in the world. So that's why we have the largest number of speakers in this session. <laughs> of course, thank you very much for mentioning about Quad. Uh, it's a Japanese invention, as well as a concept of the Indo-Pacific, which is generally regarded as the invention of uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Uh, for some reasons. Uh, many things have happened in the last one year in the Indo-Pacific region while, while we are seeing two wars. One in Ukraine, of course, and the other one in the Middle East. So we are now asking whether another war would happen soon in Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific region, of course, around Taiwan. Uh, so I like to focus on four points in my talk, initial talk. First, the possibility of contingency around Taiwan has been repeatedly discussed in the last one year. Last month, the Chinese government sent the fighter jets to monitor and warn a US a Navy aircraft that flew through the Taiwan Strait. Many observers naturally sensed the possibility of the outbreak of a military conflict between the two parts. In Japan, we have been generally saying that the possibility of war is quite small because China is not Russia. China would be more rational and more restrained. That's why the possibility is limited. But still, we can see some elements of the outbreak of war. So we have to be careful about how we should stop the happening of the war in the region. This is one thing. The other thing is that, secondly, on the, on the other hand, both China and the United States have been, have, have been searching opportunities to talk at the highest level. It is now reported that the President Xi Jinping would soon visit San Francisco to attend this year's APIC meeting. Uh, this would be, undoubtedly, a variable opportunity to ease the tension between the two greatest parts. So this is a good news. Thirdly, Japan, the number three largest economy in the world, <coughs> Japan decided to double its defense budget uh, uh, to, to, to enhance Japanese deterrence in the region. This is largely because of the fact that the US government has been repeatedly asked Japan to do so. There are so many uncertainties, and the regional powers must take more responsibilities than before. Of course, the United States is becoming much more inward-looking. And next year, we do not know who will be chosen as the next president. That's why Japan must play a larger role in stabilizing the region. Thirdly, and, and the fourthly, 
another good important thing is that the Japan and the South Korea have, have been uh, improving their relationship. This is a good news during the time of uh, great concern and wars. I think that the, this is essentially important trends for some reason. One of them is that the United States government has been trying to pursue the two governments to improve their relations because U.S. forces in Japan and the U.S. forces in Korea cannot work effectively without the cooperation between the two governments. So the, finally, the missing puzzle can be found. I mean, the United States can effectively increase deterrence in the region with much more enhanced ROK-Japan relations. So this is a good news. The US government has been trying to create a cooperation among the like-minded partners, and the Quad is one of them. So at the time when the multilateral cooperation is really difficult, we need to rely more upon the cooperation among like-minded partners as well as minilateral cooperation, minilateralism, which means, of course, AUKUS and the Quad as well as the G7. So these are the cooperation among the like-minded partners. By enlarging that cooperation, I think that we can remedy the so many problems that we are now facing. So in the sense, uh, Japan can provide many things to bring stability in the region by enhancing deterrence on one hand. But on the other hand, Japan is providing inclusive regional concepts such as in the Pacific. This is a huge inclusive regional concept based upon the free and open in the Pacific strategy, which has been driven by Japanese government, and also CPTPP as well, the largest free trade area in the region. So with these inclusive visions, I think that Japan can do something to bring stability in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting that, um, in a sense, America's policy in the region overhangs everything. And one does wonder um, if Donald Trump were to be the next president, uh, how policy might or might not change. Um, I mean, in a sense, Biden has continued much of Trump's policy towards China. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting you brought up the question uh, of uh, the need for more, for Asian powers to take more responsibility. It's very important. Uh, Kim, Ms. Chong Man. All right. Thank you, John. And thank you, uh, uh, President uh, Terry mong and uh, his team and all the organizers for the uh, World Policy Conference, uh, especially including Sang Yim. Uh, uh, I think this is an excellent occasion uh, to be uh, joining this uh, wonderful uh, team of uh, panelists. Uh, it's my first time to attend this uh, uh, World uh, Paris Conference, but it's really enlightening and informative. I think that's uh, something that I just want to uh, make highly of uh, what uh, I've been seeing. And I'm representing uh, the Federation of Korean Industries, so I'll I'd like to share uh, with you all some of the business perspectives, uh, especially uh, uh, in relation to the increasing geopolitical risks and uncertainties uh, uh, across the Indo-Pacific. And increasing geopolitical uncertainties uh, precipitated the return of so-called economic statecraft. Every government is putting economic policy priorities linked to long-term national security interest. Intensification of U.S.-China uh, uh, strategic competition is leading us to be put under increasing pressure to choose between the two sides, particularly in relation to high-tech industry investment. And secondly, the shift has been necessitated by various forms of economic coercion uh, from China uh, and other countries, as well as examples of unilateralism that has been exhibited by the United States. And there are two uh, very fundamental questions uh, that CEOs uh, in the boardroom ask themselves at a deep psychological level. One is what kind of geopolitical risks is most relevant to business decision making? The first one. And the second one is 
does economic security, which is a kind of the buzzword uh, in these uh, days, uh, to make the business environment become an even safer or more stable one? There's two questions. Let me first uh, touch upon the first question. I think this, uh, first and foremost, uh, the most fundamental threat or risk that they are feeling uh, at the business uh, uh, dimension is the U.S.-China rivalry. It's uh, no doubt. This, uh, as U.S.-China rivalry intensifies the economic security, whether it's as a policy or the initiative or the even defensive reaction to what uh, is being uh, charted out uh, within the context of the hegemonic uh, competition, uh, the governments of big powers and even middle powers are trying to adopt more uh, kind of protective and sometimes uh, kind of fortification of his own uh, the economic structure. And economic security uh, is uh, bringing uh, not only just uh, uh, limited to controls on sensitive technology such as high-end semiconductor production equipment, but also it is also extend into value networks especially critical minerals and uh, rare earth minerals uh, securement. It could also expand into a building a broad industrial base, including products with uh, relatively few national security implications, such as electric vehicles. Let me just uh, cite one example, that is uh, Samsung Electronics. Samsung has been enjoying a quite a significant um, kind of share of the market uh, in smartphones uh, up until 2016. It has been uh, on the top of the uh, market share. Now uh, it has been uh, gone down to almost 1% of the uh, market share in China. And Samsung has shut down, uh, withdrawn its uh, production plants uh, in two uh, important uh, cities in China. And they have uh, shut down the uh, TV manufacturing plants in China as well. So most of these uh, plants have been relocated to either to Vietnam or to India. So uh, India is now uh, having the largest manufacturing uh, plant of <coughs> smartphones uh, to be uh, run by uh, Samsung Electronics. So it's kind of the general relocation and realignment of the whole uh, manufacturing uh, facilities uh, uh, within the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, era, uh, area, especially uh, when it comes to a certain specific company. And the second question is related with uh, is economic security really makes making this business environment a safer and stable one? My answer is not really. Actually, economic security uh, is uh, causing a lot of uh, increase in input prices, and also instability is also uh, stirring up social and regulatory pressures on business. Widening geopolitical schisms are leading policymakers and regulators to structure and administer, administer their respective economies and business environments differently. Businesses are increasingly navigating administrative, logistical, and brand reputation risks. So rapidly inflating input prices are creating cost issues for business uh, and reduced labor flows are also forcing business uh, to spend more on uh, these uh, workforces. Lastly, I just want to uh, touch upon what Professor Yuichi Osoya has mentioned, uh, especially on uh, the improvement of uh, bilateral relations between South Korea and Japan. I do echo what uh, Professor Yuichi Osoya has mentioned. It's a, it's a bit of game-changing effect upon the regional uh, structure, uh, not only in the uh, security uh, and political realm, but also in uh, economic and trade uh, realm as well. So uh, one uh, kind of landmark example is the uh, Camp David uh, leaders meeting among South Korea, Japan, and the United States that was hosted by uh, President Biden in August uh, uh, this year. So that is uh, the first time ever stand-alone uh, trilateral uh, leaders meeting among three countries that has been uh, enabled by the warming up of uh, bilateral relations between 
South Korea, and Japan. That's a very encouraging uh, point to end on, actually. Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I was thinking, you know, uh, when you talked about how uh, you know, the, the spread of manufacturing from China has gone into Vietnam, etc. I mean, do you think that decoupling or de-risking actually is just, a, it's just a words which actually don't really have much practical effect except to make things perhaps more difficult at the political level? Is it a sort of an empty phrase that, that industry and your, your Korean <coughs> businesses can simply ignore? I will get back to you later when, this, uh, when the okay. first round is complete. All right, fair enough. <laughs> um, Hervé, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thierry, uh, for having uh, the Indo-Pacific as an issue again this year. And I'm just proposing to share a French point of view on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, France has its stance on the Indo-Pacific, and actually it has its stakes. Uh, French overseas territories in the Indo-Pacific, Pacific and Indian Ocean, that's more than, uh, uh, well, if you... Uh, get it roughly, it's uh, about uh, one and a half million inhabitants, a little more than that actually, and uh, we boast of the uh, second largest maritime domain in the world, the first one being the US, ten, the, the French one is 10 million square kilometers, the US is 12, actually the Australian one is nine and New Zealand is seven, so I wouldn't say New Zealand boasts as a major strategic power, although it has seven million, but the French we do actually boast of our 10 million square kilometers in the Indo-Pacific, mostly, at least. Uh, that's 10 million in the world, but most of it is in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the, the first thing I would stress is that uh, we did not necessarily define the concept of Indo-Pacific exactly the same way that others do. I remember last year having some discussions about this, and uh, as probably most of you know, uh, the uh, Americans mostly have defined the Indo-Pacific in a more northern and uh, uh, eastern way than we've had. Uh, the French would insist, actually, that the Indo-Pacific is the Pacific, but also the Indian Ocean. Actually, if I get it right, American organization, particularly American military organization, uh, takes the word of Indo-Pacific, but actually concentrates mostly on the Pacific. And tends not to look very much on the Indian part of it, although it has bases in cooperation with the UK in the Indian Ocean. The second point is that the US look on it is mostly northern, although AUKUS and all this, and since our territories are mostly in the southern hemisphere, the French look on the Indo-Pacific is mostly southern. So there is a difference in concept, not only between France and the US, but between the US and some <laughs> other countries. Uh, France defines itself as a uh, balancing power in the region. We had a s short discussion with Jean-Pierre this morning. Uh, uh, the French term is uh, puissance d'équilibre. We're mm -hmm. not quite sure that balancing power is a very good translation, and we're not quite sure the concept is exactly the same in French as it would be in English. But the French insist on puissance d'équilibre. We're not actually the only ones in the region, but the translation I propose to share with you is a balancing power. So, well, I think Thierry would agree with you. This is a very nice phrase to have. So, uh, I propose we discuss on, on these two aspects, actually, uh, balancing and power. Uh, France uh, would boast of an Indo being an Indo-Pacific country through its doctrine and its influence. First, uh, the, the doctrine in itself poses a status. Uh, saying we're an Indo-Pacific power uh, however, balancing power does uh, put us in a position of being amongst uh, the major powers. Not quite the size of the US and China, maybe, but a major power. This is important for us, uh, and uh, obviously geography and history helps us, defining us as that sort of power. We do understand we're not quite in the same position as the major powers in the region, neither as the small Pacific Islands, for example, thus uh, the very convenient definition of a balancing power. Uh, the uh, status is uh, underlined as uh, being uh, a side beyond 
the uh, antagonism between the US and China. This is French tradition of uh, defining itself as a sort of third term power in many circumstances. But actually here stems a first difficulty in the fact that there are many uh, uh, balancing powers, small powers or medium sized powers in the region. The Pacific Islands would not uh, acknowledge any sort of alignment uh, with China or the US alternatively. Neither would Asian countries. Indonesia itself defines itself as a balancing power. What about India? Its size is considerable in the region, its economy not quite yet, but it does not acknowledge, as far as I understand, any alignment with neither with the US nor with China. So when we define our position as being particular as a balancing power, it's not that specific as it supposes it is. Actually, the US themselves, uh, being part of many forums and uh, cooperation and dialogue schemes in the region, also play on that. I mean, in some circumstances, they're looking for some sort of alignment between powers, but in other circumstances, understanding the subtlety of the positions of different countries, they play their role in different forums that do not necessarily require any form of alignment. Okay, you do have the Quad, you have AUKUS, but the US also, for example, has organized what is called Partners in the Blue Pacific. And this is a, a cooperation with the, the very many uh, island countries you get in the uh, midst of the Pacific that does not require uh, any necessary alignment. Neither does actually the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the uh, IPEF, yeah. which uh, in a lower level comes to succeed the uh, TPP retreat in 2017. So, uh, France, in this frame, uh, particularly with the US, is a, a, an ally with many reserves. Uh, and uh, in a way, we pay the price to it. Uh, obviously, we're not in the Quad, which is US, Japan, Australia, and India. Uh, we're not in AUKUS. And as you underlined in your introduction, uh, I mean, AUKUS has to do with the way we lost the contract with Australia on nuclear submarines. Uh, and so, uh, the, the problem is that uh, being a, a balancing power is a positive definition in itself, but it's also a negative definition in the way that it defines itself as participating in many forums that others share, but having decided not to participate in some of the important forums that are aligned to the US. Uh, assertion. Uh, France actually has uh, enhanced uh, the assertion of Indo-Pacific as such, for example, uh, we have uh, been very much the uh, driving force with the definition of a trade policy for European Union in the Indo-Pacific. And for example, we've simulated Europe's engagement in uh, 2022 with a ministerial forum <coughs> between Indo-Pacific countries and uh, uh, members of government from the European Union. Our assertion is not only about uh, overall discussions and forums, it is an actual military presence although we tend very often to present as military presence and military cooperation what is very often humanitarian presence and humanitarian uh, cooperation. Military means being used for humanitarian missions, which is fair and useful, but you should not confuse both terms. Uh, we purport to have reality on the ground and at sea France as an Indo-Pacific country through its presence and connections. The presence, as I was saying, several territories in the Indian Ocean and uh, in the uh, Pacific and more than uh, one and a half million inhabitants. Uh, but one must remember that most of the connection from these territories, be it French Polynesia or Mayotte between Madagascar and Africa, most of the connections are with mainland France, and obviously there is a deficit so far on regional connections. We may have no choice in the future, actually. We remember the slides that were shown yesterday by uh, the uh, chairperson from the uh, BCG, uh, presenting what everybody knows as the regionalization of globalization. And, and this, for example, weakens the maritime routes on which we are very dependent. 
uh, all the trade that's organized between Europe and the uh, French territories in the Pacific depends on maritime routes, routes that are extremely fragile today because they are reorganized, understanding the evolution of globalization. So we have a concern, uh, a direct strategic concern shared with our allies on the security of these routes, as everybody understands in the Pacific. But we have uh, a more direct interest in the fact that they obviously are changing today and this should stimulate us in turning to new opportunities in the region. There's a gap to bridge on our regard and connections on shared interest. There are political connections with all the forums we're a member of. Uh, uh, and uh, some, I mean, the many I could say are the South Pacific Community, the Pacific Commission, the Pacific Island Forum, the Indian Ocean Commission. But there, is, there are some difficulties, for example, in articulating roles and positions, the fact that uh, our local governments in all these regions and territories are frequently members of these uh, different groupings, and sometimes they yield real power, influence, and, uh, for example, uh, trade responsibility concerning the Pacific French territories is not the responsibility for national government, but responsibility for local government. And so these local governments actually have economic responsibility, although today they mostly understand their Pacific role or Indo-Pacific role as a political one, obviously underplaying their role in the economy. We need build up more economic connections. Economies, as I was saying, are very much linked to Middle <coughs> France today, but there are some realities. For example, uh, I will let, be concluding. Let, let me cut you short. Yeah, sure. Uh, some realities, for example, in oil supply to these territories, coming from Singapore, for example, concerning Réunion, tourism as well, which is very strong from Australia or Japan in New Caledonia or from the West Coast in the US to French Polynesia. We didn't play or did not succeed in a role to be regional hubs, which usually other territories have better succeeded than we did. This is history, but France is taking a very prominent role in renewable energies, for example. Many companies uh, in renewable energies in Australia are French companies, no and Accur, for example. But they develop in the region not from our territories, but they develop from Australian bases. And so, obviously, we have to uh, reconcile tomorrow what is the political assertion we're on today and the economic developments uh, we may succeed in the future. You. I've That's given it. you far more than seven minutes, but thank you very much. You've flown the flag for France yeah. extremely <laughs> well. Thank you. And now, MK, um, I should, by the way, MK Narayan, congratulate you on the performance of the Indian cricket team, because I know you're a keen <laughs> fan of cricket. And we, we have devastated wonderful. Australia and England. <laughs> well, I'm afraid England have played terribly in the World <laughs> Cup. This, but we were the champions, but no longer. <laughs> India, you know, you, I think you will be the next champion. So congratulations. The floor you. now is yours. Seven minutes. Maybe a couple of minutes more, if you don't mind. <laughs> half, half well, half uh, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Vandya Seri. I think he's left uh, for this opportunity to present an Indian perspective on Indo-Pacific security concerns. <clears throat> I apologize at the beginning for being a mere practitioner of security rather than being an expert like the other members of this panel, but I do hope you will still give me a, a, a worthwhile listening. Uh, I begin by making a controversial statement that notwithstanding the conflict in Ukraine and the war in Gaza, the Indo-Pacific, I believe, is the pivotal theater of interstate contestation. And it is, imp it is important that we realize and recognize the fact. Listening to the debate, the previous debate, one got the impression that the war in between, in between Ukraine and Russia is the centerpiece of world history. I dare say that it's important, it's critical, all nations are important, but I, I think it's important for us to recognize that the Indo-Pacific has to be <coughs> maintained in a manner that this area does not become a part of China's backwaters, because China is the emerging power in the region and is able to do a great deal, notwithstanding some temporary hiccups that they're facing today. <clears throat> uh, I would begin by saying that um, there's another controversial statement. 
I mean, with apologies to the Japanese. Uh, you know. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe made a statement regarding the quadrilateral, the Indian Parliament, in November 2007. And um, I think it caught on. It was caught on. I feel proud that I was present on that occasion. So with your permission, may I set the record straight about that? Uh, but more to the point, I think there are, there's a great deal of controversy that surrounds what is India's role and what is India's degree of support to the Indo-Pacific. Many see India's partnership in the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which goes by the acronym QUAD, as indicative of India's willingness to be part of a military pact to contain and checkmate China. Definitely, as far as the Pacific is concerned, I do think that this would be reading too much into India's intentions. India has joined the Quad, but I think its intention is not that it would be a dedicated partner in a military confrontation with China. Dedicated partner along with the US, the United Kingdom, Australia, France, and, and Japan in a military confrontation with China. I think it's important to stress this point at the very outset, that there is any misreading of where India stands. <clears throat> I know that many non-nation uh, non countries find it difficult to comprehend India's stance, or its unwillingness to be part of any anti-China military and defense pact. I do say this because, as I was explaining a little while ago to John, I've been around for a very long time, and the history of Sino-Indian of Sino tensions and conflicts has a long one. But nevertheless, by, while we have occasional shooting wars, I would re regard them as skirmishes. Both countries believe that their, their war or conflict is civilizational rather than territorial. Um, we have an undelineated border, and therefore there are skirmishes. But I think that we don't have any major conflict, etc. There's a struggle for influence rather than a struggle for territory. I think that's important, and people don't understand why, why are we not part of Quad, or why, if AUKUS is willing to include us, why are you not part of AUKUS? Because there is this basic issue. I know this is changing uh, to some extent because China had confined itself basically to the Pacific and India basically to the Indian Ocean. India's interests were always in the Indian Ocean area and the Indian Ocean little, while as China's was in the Pacific. Lately, China has started intruding into the Indo-Pacific, but it is, uh, sorry, into the Indian Ocean, but it has not yet altered India's perspective. Whether India would change that perspective in the days to come, I cannot say. But at the moment, I think it's important to set the record straight that India does not believe in a military confrontation with China on the seas as of now. Yet, I agree that there are many, many, what should I say, and differing interpretations on how we should achieve the objective of, of containing China to some extent and not allow it to run riot, if I might say so, in the, in the Indo-Pacific. But I, I temper all that by the, my one particular reason, saying that there is a tendency of, you know, when you talk of China, to talk of extreme competition with China. I mean, it's this or not. It's not, not, not this or nothing sort of thing. I think that is something for which I think India certainly, but I'm aware that many Asian nations do not quite believe that this is the answer as to how we should go about dealing with China. As I said, India needs a strategy to contain China, along with other Asian nations. But we do not see that the only way to achieve this is through an anti-China uh, anti military, military pact. <coughs> there's a lot of debate, but there's a great deal of sober realization as well that a war could have disastrous consequences, both for China and India. China will not provoke a war with, with, with India because its target of 2049 becoming the world's number one power will, will go up in smoke. India cannot also afford a war with China because 
you just heard how the rest of the world, I mean, if Samsung is coming to India, we have the world's granary today, etc. All that will also go up in smoke if we have a conflict with China. So both China and India have reserves of strength and also reserves of beliefs as to what you need to do. So we, will, we are now strength, India is now strengthening its relationship with many of the Asian countries, particularly those who are part of the Indian Ocean, literal, but more so with Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan, for instance. Japan and India have now ties of friendship, which are almost like a military relationship, but short of being called a military, military pact. So I think that we will collaborate with the United States. We will avoid a military sort of a pact with the United States or with other countries on that, or with other countries of the West. But we will be, in that sense, anti-China. But if you are expecting that India will, will join forces to, to wage a war against China, I think we should be careful. Give me a few more minutes. I want to <clears throat> spend the order. In this context, I would say, and given the state of disorder that exists in the world over, India, I mean, in the discussions that are taking place in India, I'm not part of the mainstream today, but I still have reasons, I mean, ways and means of knowing what's going on, that many Asian countries are not very comfortable with the idea, concept of, if I might say within quotes, righteousness. I mean, it is becoming part of, I would say, the foreign policy, particularly of the United States, which involves a mixture of strong moral feelings coupled with great power. Now, we are doing the right thing. We need to go to the kind of stuff. I, I don't think that has been the history of international relations the world over. We believe, therefore, that it would be a mistake, not only for us, but also for the viewers in the West, to think that they can extract concessions from China by using military pressure tactics. We live in close proximity to China. And we are well aware of China's perfidious designs. China wants to be first the number one power in Asia, and they can, that's the only country that can withstand, or with standing between that and the, is India. So they will try to belittle or, or, or sort of reduce India's layer of influence. But we see in China not as a dangerous adversary so much as, as an imminent threat to which we have to face. The presumption of permanent hostility or adherence to a belief that China must be confronted forcefully on every issue is something that we find it difficult to adjust to. I would like to end by, oh, sorry. Oh, no. Yesterday, I was struck by the forcefulness with which the Hechi Leong spoke about Taiwan. I know that Taiwan is, is, is like Banco's ghost. All the time we keep talking about Taiwan. Taiwan is a problem. There's no mistaking the fact that it's a problem. But there is no immediate solution to, to Taiwan. I think we need to recognize, and I think this forum, we can discuss that. I believe, and I think that I'm, when I say I am not only mine, but amongst the discussions we have in the, in the security community in, in India, Time is perhaps the best option to arrive at a formula, which means maintaining the status quo for some more years. Any attempt to change the status quo through force would not only upset the global equilibrium, and could have, it would have disastrous consequences for the world. Our understanding is that China can live with the present position with equanimity for quite some more time. And I would like to say, please, Listen, we can debate it later on in this. Finally, this is my view, a very personal, a very, again, one more. I'm, I'm in, used to controversy. I've lived by my wits most of the time. I'd say that Asia, especially East Asia, needs to avoid the kind of situation that exists in Europe today, where Russia has a perennial feeling of danger and of a threat from the Euro Europe and the US, when the West sees Russia as a, as a threat that needs to be eliminated, you know, two, world, two sets of people in, in major conflict. Dealing with China is going to be very complicated, but I think patience is important. 
We need to avoid a, uh, the threat of a war on Taiwan, and we should be careful as to how go about it. Finding desirable means to achieve a modest vivendi in Ta on Taiwan is perhaps the best way to foster stability in the region. Sorry if I sound too controversial, but... Thank, thank you very you. much, MK. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Taiwan, uh, and that's perfect segue into, let's call you His Excellency the Ambassador to Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you very much, and thank you to WPC and the organizers for this opportunity to share the stage and share so many learning opportunities in the, as a member of the audience. Um, I'd like to start by framing uh, my perspective on where we are with China in the Indo-Pacific today. Uh, in terms of the, the revolutionary challenge that China presents, China has... Um, you know, is, is now, I think, the fourth in a series of revolutionary challenges to the international system that we've seen since the Napoleonic Wars, which in that case ended in the defeat of France and the rebuilding of Asia by patient and, and complicated diplomatic work uh, at that time. The next great revolutionary challenge was the fascist challenge, which was defeated in war. And again, the victors made the determination of how it would uh, be managed in the aftermath, and then the Cold War came along in the after and the uh, Soviet Union represented a revolutionary challenge to the world, but it had an inward focus. It didn't really carry itself out to the same extent. And today we find China under guise of, of revising the international system, but increasingly talking about revolutionizing that system and changing it fundamentally. And uh, China, unlike the previous defeated Napoleonic or defeated fascist forces or the, the collapsed uh, Soviet Cold War era, the China today um, has a, still has a foot in the, the, the world as we know it, the, the, the rules-based order. It's been profiting from that. But it also wants to change it. So th I think we need to look in the long term at how we're going to find a new equilibrium, a new way to manage this Chinese uh, um, uh, ambition. Uh, China, as a result of being a, a product of four decades of involvement in the international system, of investment in China, and China's becoming the major uh, trading and manufacturing partner for most of the world, uh, China has also made itself vulnerable. It has, it has to protect those interests as it goes forward with its own ambitions. Um, <coughs> the uh, Biden administration came to office having inherited a chaotic approach to China in the Indo-Pacific under Donald Trump. Um, if you recall, I think some mention was made earlier today of the finger pointing that went on in Anchorage, Alaska between the American diplomatic representatives and the Chinese and the Chinese complained, the U.S. said it wanted to deal with China from a position of strength and derided that American position. Well, we had a couple of years pass by, and the U.S. has, and the Biden administration has worked hard to, to reconstitute our, the quality of our relations to that which prevailed before the Trump administration came to office. And we saw the U.S. in Japanese and Korean alliances strengthened. The alphabet soup has been mentioned of AUKUS and the, uh, strengthening the Pacific Islands. We've been ignoring the Pacific Islands for 20 years, but China woke us up to our interests and concerns there. Uh, we have the AUKUS arrangement, which I, I'm hoping will be something material, but it's still a promise, not really a, a reality. And the, and the, and the Quad. And today, as Biden prepares to host Xi Jinping at the APEC meeting in San Francisco, I think he can take satisfaction that compared to two years ago in the Anchorage meetings, uh, the United States now is in a much greater position of strength to deal with China as they go forward. Now, um, the, the APEC meeting uh, will mark only one moment in the continuing competition between the U.S. China, despite a slowing economy, uh, it continues to develop unprecedented military capabilities. Um, the U.S. is challenged to uh, 
upgrade its own military capabilities while being uh, compelled to provide assistance to Ukraine and now to the Israelis in Gaza. Uh, the U.S. is also challenged by having old habits that have not been revised to meet modern requirements. The, our military industry has fallen behind. Our the ways of dealing with the military industry through Congress and through the Defense Department need to be upgraded. Our, our processes are slow. There are multiple demands on resources. Domestic demands are up because the American people are tired of paying for uh, maintenance of the peace around the world. They want a peace dividend. Uh, all of these uh, are, are, are putting pressure on the U.S. in ways that make it uh, not easy for the U.S. to simply you know, enter into a confrontation or make a series of demands. We have to find ways to, to chisel away at our problems in the Asia-Pacific region, in the Indo-Pacific region, and, and China will work all the while to make these harder. I understand China has announced that it's willing to be hosting a Hamas delegation shortly. Uh, there are, China has interests in the Middle East. They need energy from the Middle East more than the United States does. But we both have an interest in keeping the energy supplies from the Middle East going forward. And there's a, there's a basis for a kind of uh, standoffish cooperation between the U.S. and China on restoring peace in the, in the Middle East. But that has to be explored. It has to be uh, found. And that's not uh, present. Uh, at the moment, China seems to be rather eager to take advantage of the distress the Middle East is causing and hope that the U.S. will be further distracted from the Taiwan and, West, and the Asia Pacific uh, sets of challenges that China is posing. Um, the, the main area where the United States is falling behind, hasn't done enough to re-strengthen its position, is economic. Uh, we should never have walked away from TPP in 2016 and the end of the Clinton campaign. Uh, we should be talking about CPTP, TPP. Uh, we, uh, IPEC is a, you know, it's a worthy effort, but it's not, it's not a, a substantial and attractive uh, offer for the parties in the region who have become increasingly dependent on trade and investment uh, with China itself. And I'm not optimistic that either the Democrats or the Republicans, should they take power in the next administration, would be willing to bite the bullet on uh, dealing with the economic challenges that we face in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Now, a word about Taiwan, where I, I served as an unofficial ambassador. Um, this is now, it remains, the most dangerous flashpoint in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Over the past year, the Biden administration has, in my view, retreated from its more confrontational approach to our past agreements with China on how to manage Taiwan affairs. We had an era, an era where, starting with the end of the Trump administration and through the beginning of the Biden administration, the U.S. was sort of pushing the envelope on official dealings with the people of Taiwan. Um, since May of this year, when uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, and China's counterpart, Wang Yi, met in Vienna, the U.S. has been walking the line more carefully. It's uh, what I call a, a restoration of diplomatic discipline. This is not, not something you do alone. You don't just retreat and uh, yield to Chinese demands, but you also pair that with an effort to strengthen Taiwan's ability to deter aggression. China's growing military capabilities uh, can't be dismissed, but they can't be confronted directly either, except at great cost. The question is how to find the balance between deterrence and diplomatic discipline that keeps the peace in the, in the Asia-Pacific re region. <clears throat> What's the outlook for the 21st century in the, in the Indo-Pacific? In my view, Xi Jinping and his revolutionary ambitions look to dominate the next decade or more, uh, with Xi himself in charge. And um, the, a mixture of discipline and deterrence will be required if the U.S., despite competition for national priorities at home, uh, and leadership in other parts of the world uh, will have to have a sustained, steady, measure-by-measure -measure approach to the Indo-Pacific. My belief, however, is that the, the, the people of China and that the China we know today of Xi Jinping is not forever. 
And as we move forward in our efforts to uh, incentivize peaceful resolution of disputes uh, in the Indo-Pacific and make the alternative of using force unattractive, we also should keep the door open to the Chinese people at all times so that they understand that our competition is not with the people of China, but with the behavior of a certain government in China. And that if China's willing to change its behavior, the U.S. will be willing to cooperate to help make a 21st century that achieves what the Congress of Vienna did in the 18th century and what the, 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 the bright men and women of the uh, end of the World War II period did to establish a way of maintaining a balance in global affairs to uh, stem this revolutionary uh, disruption and to allow us to build a, a peaceful future. So thank you for that. Thank you very much indeed, Doug. Um, I, I note that you are not allowing Xi Jinping to be immortal. You have a, a time limit for him. Um, do you have a guess at when China will change? You know, I, I have been lucky enough to know a lot of Chinese for quite a few years, and, and when we can get together, I think they're pretty frank about the shortcomings of their current leadership, but they're also frank about the risks of, t of ch taking on the current leadership. So the question is waiting out the current leadership and, and not closing doors to a more cooperative and productive future between China and the various uh, the countries of the region and the world, for the matter. I'm tempted to have a second round, but I don't think I will, because we want to have questions from the audience. But what I note in all your presentations, um, I don't think North Korea was <laughs> mentioned once. And yet it dominated, in a sense, the, the, the Trump, the first, I hope, personally, the last Trump presidency. Um, uh, who should, Mr. Kim. What is happening with your neighbor to the north? Well, that's, uh, uh, quite interestingly, uh, in economist uh, intelligence unit uh, has recently published Risk Outlook 2024. They have listed up top 10 risk elements, but North Korea, whether it's nuclear or missile uh, proliferation or the nuclear issue was not listed was not singled out as one of the top 10 risk. So I think that's uh, quite a, a, back in Korea, I think there's, uh, of course, the South Korean people are more or less get, uh, getting used to uh, kind of the perennial threat uh, coming from the North, but I think there's uh, 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 this uh, North Korean uh, threat or risk is a kind of the given factor for the Korean business. And also some of the, uh, the Western and other foreign uh, partner, business partners are, are taking into account that is uh, the kind of the uh, constant uh, kind of factor that would be uh, fitted into their uh, equation for the business. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, that's one uh, part of the answer for uh, what, uh, why this uh, North Korean factor was not uh, listed. Is dangerous up. complacency or? Uh, and I think that the level of uh, threat or level of uh, threat perception has remained more or less the same. Of course, this, uh, they have included that uh, the first use of that uh, nuclear weapons even to be included in that uh, their constitution. So that is quite alarming. And also this uh, a series of uh, intercontinental ballistic missile tests that is also alarming. But still, I think this. Uh, People in the uh, boardroom, I mean, CEOs are more concerned about intensification of the U.S.-China hegemonic uh, rivalry. It was Doug who brought us back to the CPTPP and sensibly, in my opinion, said how foolish it was of America to duck out of the TPP. But um, South Korea, of course, is not in the CPTPP. Uh, we are not in yet, uh, and uh, perhaps I think there's a next year the Korean government is uh, trying to uh, make a push for uh, the, uh, their participation into CPTPP. And of course, Britain, which is a long way away from, right, uh, from you know, the Indo Pacific region, region as well, is right. joining. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I wonder, I mean, uh, Hoichi, um, I mean, originally when the TPP was envisaged, it was a way of keeping China out. Now, China wants to join the CPTPP. From a Japanese point of view, would China be welcome? 
Yes, uh, quite interesting question. Of course, I think that within the Japanese government, many officials are examining the possibility as well as the result of Chinese participant. First of all, the hurdle is extremely high. So uh, it is quite unlikely that China can pass the hurdle. This is one thing. The other thing is that if... You mean this would be a way of keeping China out? Well, uh, in addition to the original members. Now, UK is going to be a member of the GPPPP, so that handle will be higher for China to enter into it. So if China clear all the barriers to enter into the TPP, it means that the China should promote political and economic reforms. These would be welcome to, welcome to Japan or other members of the GPTPP. So the both cases, Number one, the hurdle is still very high, and so it is quite unlikely that China can join in it. Number two, uh, if China can reform politically and economically its own system, it's also very welcoming. But at the same time, we need to stick the original point. We shouldn't be affected by Chinese pressure to lower the hurdle. So as far as this continues, I think it's okay. Uh, let me, uh, we only have 15 minutes left, 14 actually. Uh, gentleman there, and the microphone is coming. Yes, maybe a question for Jean-Pierre Cabestan. As we understood from the panel, the Indo-Pacific is a rather floating concept. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but as far as I know, Jean-Pierre, it is not used as such by Chinese diplomats, it is even refused. Uh, so what is the Chinese wording for the same region? Maybe it's not exactly the same limits. And which are the arguments to refuse uh, the Japanese-born Indo-Pacific concept? Thank you. Interesting question. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. Yes, I, I didn't mention that at the beginning, but China doesn't, as you said, doesn't like the concept of Indo-Pacific because it sees, it sees in it uh, an, um, an intention to contain China. And the alternative concept proposed by China, and China stuck to it, is uh, um, the Asia-Pacific region, where China is uh, in a much stronger position. The irony is, that China is more and more active in the Indian Ocean, actually. And now it has a base in Djibouti. Uh, every, every day, uh, seven or eight of its naval ships sail in the Indian Ocean. So I India is important for China also because most of its uh, oil comes from the Middle East or Africa. So even if uh, it has uh, tried to diversify its uh, energy sources in importing more... And it has oil access from, from to the Indian Ocean through Gwalior from China... Yes, e e uh, from, 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 China from Burma, yes, yeah. from Burma, uh, through, through Burma. And, and it has also diversified its uh, sources of energy in importing more from the Central Asia and, in, and more recently from Russia. Uh, as you know, uh, it has doubled its trade with Russia and mainly in importing much more oil than before. So, so that's where we are. And of course, the, the fact that the uh, US uh, PACOM has been renamed Indo PACOM in Hon Honolulu in, uh, has also uh, contributed to China's uh, um, suspicion about the Indo Pacific concept. And the fact that it was Abe Shinzo who coined the um, expression in uh, 2007 and then it was picked up by the uh, Trump administration in 2017 when the, pink, when the Trump administration decided to uh, launch a new uh, free um, and open <coughs> Indo Pacific strategy, uh, of course, uh, uh, targeting China more than anything else. So clearly, there is no reason for China to, uh, to promote that concept, but just uh, the opposite to, to uh, criticize. A question it. there, the microphone, for two questions. Thank you. I'm oh, you, can, you can fight for the microphone. So t I'll take two questions from you, first of all, and then from uh, the gentleman there. Yes. Sure. Thank you. I'm Christian Rodriguez Schaeffer from the Boston Consulting Group. In a previous life, I was one of Chile's uh, lead negotiators for the TPP, so I, I felt oh, compelled, <laughs> uh, given that you spoke a lot about the agreement. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership well, and the CPTPP, as the Transatlantic Treaty between Europe and the US, as the 
China-US bilateral investment treaty, which was negotiated for 10 years, and others are agreements, right, are rules, such as the World Trade Organization is. Everything we're seeing today are deals, understanding, alliances. And um, question for any one of the panelists, do you see space in the short term, I'm sure no, but in, even in the medium term, for rules to come back, for trade agreements, for actual treaties that have you know, provisions that have become international rules which need to be abided by all countries at the uh, bilateral or plurilateral level. I'm not dreaming about multilateral agreements uh, anytime. Okay, question there, and then gentlemen there. Um, <clears throat> well, I think uh, we had a very important uh, discussions uh, about the new trend in, in the Indo-Pacific. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, panels uh, uh, really reflected, I mean, uh, very important stakeholders in the region. Uh, well, uh, but uh, I would like to bring uh, your attention uh, to the role uh, Canada can play uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Well, uh, as late comers, I mean, Korea and Canada released uh, its important foreign policy and security uh, guidelines uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, last uh, December. So uh, we will act, I mean, uh, uh, according to the strategy, I mean, uh, uh, released between uh, Canada and Korea. Uh, last week, uh, there was a forum uh, between Korea and uh, Canada, and Canada emphasized they will increase uh, and enhance the role play in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region uh, by uh, bringing in uh, more resources uh, than before. So uh, they will uh, help, I mean, uh, some underdeveloped members of the Indo-Pacific uh, for uh, better, I mean, uh, welfare and uh, uh, development of its uh, their economies. Well, uh, I think we heard a very important point uh, about the uh, quad. I mean, from uh, Indian participant, uh, uh, my friend Narayan. Well, uh, he emphasized uh, the way we look at uh, Chinese uh, uh, military advancement or. Uh, potential threats quite different from other members of the Indo-Pacific. So uh, there is quad uh, that is a very important uh, component of the security uh, uh, policy of uh, all Indo-Pacific uh, nations. Uh, so Korea uh, uh, thought about uh, joining the quad uh, as uh, uh, quote plus, but uh, uh, in the uh, forum last week, well, uh, some uh, member uh, pointed out, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the point, I mean, Narayan uh, just indicated. So uh, there was uh, some proposal that uh, because uh, North Pacific uh, threats, uh, security threats are from the countries in the North Pacific, North Korea, China, and Russia. So what about we form uh, the new Quad, uh, US, Japan, and Korea, and Canada? Uh, so what do you think? Good question. Uh, who's going to do, there was a, the trade question as well from, sorry, can you remind me of that question again? Well, I, I, uh, I'll, let me take on the question. Oh, yeah, sure. I, I think uh, as the TPP negotiator, you'll recall that in the, the early days, the question was, why do a TPP? And the answer from the negotiators at the time was, if we create a high quality trade agreement, it will not be universal at the outset. Trying to get the WTO to do the Doha round was a great failure because consensus was the enemy of practical progress. But to do a TPP among the world's largest trading partners at a high level of equality would be an attraction for others to join. The idea is you start as, as big as you can with co a coalition of willing partners, and then you build on that by creating something whose gravitational pull will be very strong. I think as we go into a new period of reconstructing the world in this post-Cold War era, 
Uh, we're going to have to take things a bit by bit, step by step, practical by practical measure, sort of the way Jean Monnet and George Marshall and others made small steps in the aftermath of World War II to rebuild Europe. Uh, trade, the trade world we should view as um, something we can't do overnight, but we create a, a momentum toward uh, an outcome that will, in the long run, be okay. one that leads to a global consensus that is the right but way to go. Thank you very much. It's, it's, and Canada, of course, is always everybody's favorite North American. So. Um, we only have five minutes and 43 seconds left. <laughs> I know that both MK and Hervé wanted to say something. MK. <clears throat> no, I, <clears throat> there's no magic wand to deal with, with China. Uh, I think the answer to, to how to deal with China is not to have more and more packs. I mean, we, I think there, is, uh, there are enough packs available. I think the United States has taken on more than its, what, what should be its role in these matters. I think we need a concerted strategy as to how to reduce Chinese influence across the region. I think one measure has already started by, I mean, economically, if you can bring down um, uh, China in many ways, you can do that. The other is for the other nations to understand the, the, the uh, making of the Chinese mind. I think it's, much, it's really a conflict. And I think I would think that countries like Japan, India, and others who have dealt with China over the years can play a very major role. It's not merely a question of guns and butter sort of stuff. I think it's a deal, dealing with an, it's an ancient civilization. It's now divided and split in many ways. Can we do something to reduce that? What you, if there is a confrontation, China will get, the Chinese population will get together. We need to sort of get, um, how do you separate Xi Jinping from, um, from the rest of the Chinese country? There are a lot of people in China who want a different uh, kind of a system. I think we should emphasize that, and I think that's where some of the think tanks and others can play a very major role. I do think it is counterproductive to add more and more facts, and i stop with that. Thank you. Yes, so I would be uh, more pessimistic than Douglas, uh, since indeed the concept is uh, really a floating concept, and with the uh, very difficult appreciation of situations, I believe that the multiplicity of organizations and schemes today is convenient for many partners the major ones and the uh, medium and minor ones. Uh, and I do not see why this should evolve in the uh, short and medium term. Excellent. Uh, final question. Any? Yes, gentleman over there on the right. <clears throat> Good evening. My question is why South Korea... Sorry, can't, we can't hear you very well. Microphone. Yeah, my question is why South Korea was excluded from the Quadra Alliance between UK, US, Australia, and Japan. What, so why South Korea was excluded from AUKUS? Yes. No, from <laughs> the Quad. From the Quad. From the, from oh, the from Quad, quad. Or from, from the quad. AUKUS? Uh, um, was well, that a Jap Well, a Japanese sort of invented the quad, so... Uh, you may start with uh, Yuji, right. yes. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't catch uh, the, the question. The I question. think, if I heard it correctly, was why was South Korea excluded from the quad? From the quad. Well, no, 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 no. Uh, from the beginning, uh, South Korea didn't really like to join in a group which can be regarded as a confrontation to China because China is extremely important trading partner to, to South Korea. Korea. Yeah. So, in the beginning, uh, well, I think South Korea thought that uh, it was not quite wise to join it. But uh, wisely, the four countries, particularly India, partly Japan, have been transforming the nature of Quad. From the be uh, at the beginning, Quad was much more security cooperation organization, a uh, uh, grouping. But after that, the four are focusing on much more technology and the COVID-19 vaccination and so on, these kind of te technical issues. That's why the Quad now is much less confrontational to China. So I think Quad can be accepted to much broader numbers of countries in the region, I suppose. Okay. We have... Well, 
Yes, just uh, 30 seconds, I think, uh, just to add to what uh, Professor Yujiu Soya has mentioned is that to uh, answer your question, I think there's a, there's a quite a uh, myriad of uh, issues or the uh, regions uh, behind the decision when uh, Korea was not uh, at, the at the very beginning not to initiate uh, <coughs> and also take part in the whole discussion to join Quad. I think the main primary factor is how to deal with China. And the second is uh, kind of the bilateral relations between Korea and Japan at that time. It was not that uh, comfortable and a bit souring relations between uh, South Korea and Japan. And also kind of uh, the, we do have, um, South Korea has uh, quite uh, rock solid uh, uh, alliance uh, partnership with the United States. So I think this bilateral security alliance has been backbone of the whole the foreign policy uh, foundation uh, on the part of the South Korea. That, that, those are the reasons why uh, South Korea at the big <coughs> beginning has not uh, joined the discussion. Thank you. Um, we are almost out of time. There's a few seconds left. I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, the Indo-Pacific region has plenty of flashpoints. So um, flashpoints, by definition, risk exploding. So on a scale of 10, they will explode somewhere, Taiwan, North Korea, whatever. Or zero, no, they will not explode. If you take the next five years, where do you put your mark? Okay, 10, there will be an explosion flashpoint within the next five years. Zero, there will not be. Doug, I, it's I a one, word, one number answer. Yeah, I, when it comes to the Taiwan question, it's about two, uh, okay, in two. my view. Yeah. All right, uh, so it's a low word. MK. I, I think the world has enough wisdom to avoid a flashpoint on Taiwan. So I would maybe I'd put it at one or two. Front. One or two, excellent, very good. Uh, Hervé. Two. Two, okay. Uh, That's uh, about Taiwan issue or the... No, any flashpoint. It could be oh. as long as the Indo-Pacific. So Taiwan could be Aksai Chennai in India That's, or it could uh, be... Well. For me, it's a South China Sea. Okay, and... The answer would be, on your scale of zero, it's no problem. I think it's a five. Sorry? Five. Five. Okay, mm, excellent. I'm optimistic. That's why Taiwan, seven. Seven? Yeah. Oh. So, big explosion. Wow, okay. Jean-Pierre? Well, two, two marks. One for the South China Sea, three. Taiwan, four. Well, it's a kind of sobering um, outlook, perhaps, with a five-year time horizon. And uh, there will be an important election in the United States next year, and the term will be a four-year presidency, so that, <coughs> I suppose, adds another uh, uh, perspective to the, the number. Um, I'd like to thank the audience very much. I'd like to thank Sonim and Thierry, who's not here, for getting this excellent panel together, and I think the panel have been very good and deserve a very good round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.